and changes in the face of brain damage and disease. This research program has built on an international collaboration that delivered the virtual brain and now integrates research efforts globally to accelerate research and translation. The goals of this effort are to integrate and the, the modeling platform into the standard workflow of clinical decision support and to develop a cloud-based system where anyone can create brain models for research, clinical use, or education. The lecture he is presenting to us today is titled Modeling Network Dysfunction, Function and Dysfunction with the Virtual Brain. Thank you, Dr. McIntosh. Thank you, Felix. Appreciate the introduction. Um, and good, good day, everybody. Uh, nice to, uh, <clears throat> to join you today from, uh, from my basement in Vancouver, my basement office. Um, let me get my uh, slides ready here. Um, I, think it's, I think it's that one. Right? Yeah. Okay. Good. So um, let me just open up my presentation. Um, so uh, I will be talking about the virtual brain, uh, going through uh, some of the theoretical uh, bases for it, um, a lot more on the mechanics of how we put it together, and then um, we'll focus on some of the applications to uh, looking at intrinsic activity in the brain, uh, but then also extending it into clinical applications um, uh, for the last part of the talk. Uh, I do want to start by just uh, in acknowledging that there's a, new, a massive team that's been involved in building this platform. It was um, built uh, over almost really close to 20 years now. Um, the science has been driven primarily from uh, myself, Victor Yerson, Marseille, and Petra Ritter in Berlin, but many other people, Michael Breakspear, Gustavo Deco, Steve Small, Anna Slodkin, and Olaf Sporns have all contributed bits and pieces over the years, either directly through code or through helping with uh, helping to test and build the platform. Um, they also, it's important to acknowledge that um, we, we really focused on uh, making the platform as usable as possible. Um, and in doing so, we actually started working with some companies um, in Germany. Um, Jochen Mersman, who's the CEO of a company called uh, code uh, code box. It's been working with us since the beginning um, to make sure that the, the code is uh, is well documented, that we have good version control, um, and that the the code is curated pro properly. Um, it is open source, um, but I think having that partnership is quite important for making the platform uh, usable. So, um, as I mentioned, what I'm going to talk about first sort of the theory and the architecture behind the virtual brain. Um, then focus on how we model intrinsic activity by merging um, two different imaging modalities, EEG and functional MRI. And then I'll finish off with um, uh, a clinic application focusing primarily on epilepsy. I'll give you some small examples in other domains, but the main focus will be on epilepsy, which has been probably the most successful application thus far. Um, so the platform, uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's open source. You can download it uh, now if you want. Um, there's actually now probably about 40,000 or so on downloads. Um, it doesn't mean 40,000 users, but that means that there are at least 40,000 um, versions of the, plat of the software sitting on someone's computer. Um, it runs on, on almost all um, operating systems, Windows, Mac, and Linux, so it can run on laptops or if you want to do more complicated models, it can be um, put onto high performance computing clusters um, and it can run either as a GUI um, front end, or you can also use uh, Python uh, notebooks to, to run from the command line, which makes it much easier to, to deploy in a high performance computing system. <clears throat> um, the, the general way it's, it's set up is it, it does focus on um, large scale models. Um, so it, it focuses on trying to get some representation of the entire brain, um, usually either a surface uh, or parcellations regions of interest. Uh, and then it looks at the, the integration between local activity, um, usually represented by some sort of you know, mean field approximation, um, and then long range connectivity that's uh, imparted through other imaging modalities. So you end up having some sort of either a node based system like that, or we're actually looking at also modeling neural fields. I won't cover that much today, but much of what we've done thus far has been in this, in this kind of domain where you've got um, point estimates, points, we see regions basically, uh, or nodes, and then you've got the edges determined from, um, from anatomy. 
the um, workflow um, is indicated here in this in this uh, in this uh, diagram. Um, the merger starts with some sort of representation of the cortical surface. The platform itself has um, these things already built in, but the the main uh, advantage of TBB is this can also be applied to individual data. So you can take MRI data from any individual and put it into this particular model. So for example, you can get a measure of a person's cortical surface using T1 image, T1 weighted MRI, for example, and then parcelate it into different regions of interest, or as again, as you can also do surfaces. You estimate connectivity. Um, that can be done, again, through either existing information that's out there, or um, you can use um, diffusion weighted imaging to do tractography estimates to get some ideas of whether or not periods are connected, um, at least using the, the division tensor modeling. Uh, you then impart the dynamics at the nodes using some sort of mean field approximation or mass. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you can also stimulate the model directly. You can just either stimulate nodes themselves, or we have models now that can do uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. Um, there's ap application to deep brain stimulation as well. Um, and then this is also a way to impart things like cognitive uh, challenges by doing representing cognition as a stimulation that propagates through the brain. Um, these are all done as local field potential models, but using forward solutions, you can generate um, fMRI bold um, EEG and MEG data, or also uh, stereotaxic EEG, which is important for uh, the models of epilepsy. And this next slide shows you the general um, e equation that um, uh, is, is a part of TBB. Um, the various the differences come in, in in this population activity terms how that population activity is, is modeled. What you have the the is you have some sort of change in the population dynamics that are based on the, the current state of the population or previously the population dynamics, and this is where you put in the state equations for things like either um, activity or um, phenomenological measures. Um, you ha then have the input from other uh, adjacent um, regions. Um, and then you have long range input, which would include time delays, um, which is important in getting the, the kinds of um, reasonable activity that you see in empirical data. This is the input term for stimulation. And then this last term is, uh, is the local noise term, which could be uh, Gaussian noise, it could be one over F noise. Um, there are a number of ways that can be modeled as well. You can think about this in sort of a conceptual way. If you have a, a full brain here and you have a region um, in the back of the brain, the occipital region, this region could be modeled through. Uh, a mean field approximation where you could have things like excitatory inhibitory uh, populations within a region, um, their mutual interactions, and then the connections with other local regions. And then through estimating tractography, you also have the long range connections where you have the connections of that mean for that population with other parts of the brain where the time delays become uh, much more important. Um, this is not an exhaustive list of all of the different. Um, um, mean field approximations we have, there's actually 25 now um, that are available in the virtual brain. Um, the reason we did that, um, gave you this, these options, is that we wanted to make sure that um, you weren't set with having to use a particular mean field approximation. You could either use ones from the number of our list, or you could actually input your own as well. So this is part of the platform, is it allows you to modify it um, for your own needs. We don't model uh, the cell level, uh, the synaptic level. We actually model more sort of population activity again. So we've got synaptic activity, local field potentials through uh, a reduced one way model. Also, some work from Victor and colleagues in the 2D and 3D Stefanowski Ursa model. Firing rate models, the old Wilson Cowan, but there's also the Renell Wang, Jensen Ritt, which is good for EEG data. And then a number of phenomenological models. Uh, just basically oscillatory models. And then the one for epilepsy, which we'll talk about later, is the epileptor model. But again, these are all um, available. These can be modified uh, according to your own needs. Um, and they can, all models can be described by nonlinear dynamical systems and um, via differential equations that are inherent in the map, in the Python code. Um, in addition to modeling humans, there's now the possibility of modeling mice. Um, we've used the Allen Brain um, Atlas to um, get the structural connectivity for a general mouse connectome. 
uh, and this again can use exactly the same workflow to model local the local dynamics using some sort of mean field approximation, and then generate things like simulated build signals, um, functional connectivity, and then looking at things like graph metrics to see if we can reproduce some of the patterns you see there. Um, you can use again, you can use just the what's in the in the software already, which is just the Allen Brain Atlas, or if you have mouse data you want to incorporate, you can use um, the module to incorporate your own mouse data directly. We also have a CAC uh, version that was released uh, uh, two years ago. Um, Kelly Shen in my lab was the one who developed that using some uh, data from uh, the University of Western Ontario, Seth and Eberling's lab, uh, collected a lot of macaque data in high field MRI, and that became the basis for creating this, this macaque model. So this is based about, on about 20 macaques. And again, you can use this as a canonical model for macaque, or if you have your own data, you can incorporate that directly into the platform. Um, we're also working now to build a marmoset uh, version, and uh, that should be ready probably uh, around uh, sometime, sometimes in, in the spring of the coming year. Uh, and finally, um, uh, there's a lot of training available on our virtual room website itself. The TV web website has use cases in there. Um, it has uh, very worked through both in Python as well as in the GUI. So if you want to learn it, you can use those. There are also um, a lot of our workshops have been recorded and are, are available through uh, the INCF training space. Um, where they've hosted a lot of our, our workshop uh, materials. So that's where we have the didactic lectures and sort of hands-on um, uh, examples as well. And uh, Virtual Brain is also now becoming part of um, broader initiatives uh, looking at um, uh, the integration with, for example, in Europe, the Human Brain Project, and more recently into eBrains, which is the next generation of the Human Brain Project. And that will allow the Virtual Brain to be incorporated now with a lot of other um, uh, models types. For example, you can do um, spiking neuron models now with things like NEST. So you'll see some hybrid models coming out uh, very shortly where we've, you merge scales by being able to do things like the virtual brain and the NEST simulator together. Um, and this is actually quite exciting because now we'll be able to, to look at how to extend the model both in terms of its application to local um, cell models, but potentially also moving it upwards into things like medical informatics and potentially even neurorobotics is, if that's um, something that can be done a bit later on. Um, before I jump into um, the examples, I want to just make it very clear a distinction. I'm sure most of you know this already, but I just wanted to, to, to emphasize that um, modeling in neuroscience, um, there's a number of different flavors that one can um, incorporate, think about in terms of how things are modeled, generally speaking, but also in neuroscience, because we're talking about virtual brain. I want to talk about the neuroscience um, can, um, domain. And one useful distinction, this is not necessarily dichotomy, but it is worthwhile making the distinction between generative and predictive models. Um, virtual brain um, is definitely a generative model. The idea is to try uh, and infer a model that generates the empirical data, and that's really what is at the heart um, of the virtual brain. So we infer network properties and then generate the observed MRI data to see whether or not what the model generates is consistent with what you um, are seeing in the empirical data. Um, and that provides you with uh, the potential for making some sort of cause or mechanistic inferences um, about uh, the, the model and, potential and, and the system that you're trying to model. So it has that distinct advantage that allows you to do um, very specific inferences about the mechanisms that generate um, the data. Um, but the models that are our model, so they're not necessarily um, uh, the best model. Uh, you have to actually test it against other models. So model, model fit, model identifiability, um, specificity is also a big issue, of course, in generative models. Uh, and that's a, a challenge, but it's also you know, an advantage that we actually have. You can do some inferences there. Um, predictive models or discriminative models are much more common, I think, in neuroscience writ large, certainly in the era of big data where you gather uh, masses of data like Human Brain Project or UK Biobank, for example, where you've got brain data, but also a plethora of um, genetic data, demographic information, social demographic information, and so on. And all these things are put into a, a large um, predictive model, machine learning, for example, and then generate predictions in terms of um, the um, 
he just sees that distinguished, for example, groups or predict some sort of disease states and so on. So, for example, you might use MRI data to infer the natives, the features that are necessary to predict, for example, decline in dementia. Um, the advantage, of course, is it is uh, telling you what are the best predictors for certain things, the predictors for um, cancer, predictors for um, uh, dementia, as another one I mentioned, for example, predictors of psychotic, psychotic issues, predictors of potentially predictors of, of, of clinical outcome as well. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is that um, the causal mechanistic inferences are difficult because you don't actually incorporate that as part of the model. You can merge them. And you'll see some examples of that later, but it's worthwhile making that distinction between the um, uh, generative model, which is definitely TDV, versus machine learning models. I just want to check what's here in the chat window. Right yeah, that's for me or someone else. Okay, see you, Dave. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go start with some examples. Um, this is the first one. This is probably the one that's had the most work, was really trying to infer. Um, the intrinsic activity um, uh, in, in the brain from the measures you have of EEG and fMRI, and then trying to get an idea at the, at the biophysical level, um, what generates the intrinsic activity and how do we think about the, the balance things of, for example, excitation inhibition. So we're using virtual brain in this context to try and bridge scales. Much of what we measure um, in imaging courses at the macro scale, where you just got sort of masses of tissue that you're measuring across the brain, you don't really have the ability with imaging, for example, to measure particular uh, neurons, um, you're actually measuring sort of general features. Um, so what we want to try and do in the model is actually get more of an idea of what's happening at the mesoscopic scale. And so here our models is basically taking these large circuits and putting them together in a large scale model, looking at things like um, the excitatory inhibitory balance in cortical regions, but also potentially thalamus and other parts of the brain. Microscale, we don't do much, but we can get, we start trying to infer some of the microscale features, but we don't really have access to directly in the modeling per se. So much of the inferences are done at this particular level directly. And the challenge, of course, is that if you really model these whole things, each of these spatial scales have multiple time scales. So time and space. Um, is both a, a, a good feature of the brain, but also makes it difficult for modeling. Um, I'll just leave that there for you to, to consider in terms of when you try to put together models that try and span the entire scale um, of the brain. This particular application was published several years ago. Misha Scherner and Petra Ritter's lab was the lead on that. Uh, and the notion here was that um, we had a, a data set um, that had simultaneous um, EEG and fMRI acquired in individuals while they were sitting in the scanner um, in a resting state, just basically looking at it across with their eyes open. Um, and from there, we, we, we derived again EEG, um, individual T1s, diffusion tensor imaging to um, just construct the virtual brain models. We did the virtualization of these, people, these individuals and had um, the diffusion tensor that gives you the, the connections between regions. And then what we did is use the EEG source model data as the input um, to the model to drive the dynamics in the local fields, and then have the output would be the spikes that were then convolved um, using forward solutions into fMRI data to see whether using the EEG data, pushing it through the model, modifying the parameters, do we actually re reproduce some features of the MRI data? And if so, what are the critical parameters that do that? So in the model, um, we use the reduced Wang Wang model, um, and the uh, the critical um, features that we modify are allowed to to be estimated with the what's called global coupling factor, global scaling of the long range connections, and then the local uh, parameters for the excitatory and inhibitory um, activity um, in the or inputs, I should say, into the particular um, local mean fields. So there's just 68 regions. This is just the example of uh, from one subject using the um, 68 region parcellation and the amplitude measures of fMRI across time. Um, so the top um, row is the is the uh, black is the simulated data, 
and the gray is the actual empirical fMRI. And you see that the overlap is pretty good with the um, simulated, the source model data, we actually use the EG source to drive the data. If you use alpha, just alpha power in the region, you'll see that you do produce some uh, patterns, but it's actually anti-correlated with the fMRI, which is something that we actually, we know. Um, if you do some control experiments where you do your permutation of the source inputs um, randomly, or just put in white, noise directly, you don't produce the time series as well. So the best fit is really to with the, either with the um, simulated the source activity, I should say, or um, the alpha. Um, if you look at function connectivity, how regions are, are correlated uh, across time with fMRI, uh, you find that the model uh, with the source model actually is much better um, than the alpha model. Um, you can see some examples. This is the model functional activity. This is the empirical functional activity. Um, this is using the alpha uh, input. And this is the actual structural connectivity matrix that was, was used in the, in the, in the particular case. Um, the main point being here is that if you compare the source using the source structured um, input versus the um, other control experiments, you find, first of all, that in the time series, you do much better with the, the source model data. And with functional connectivity, you also do better with the source model data. You do find, interestingly, that the um, other control ones, the random permutation, the noise, do okay. Um, and partly that's because I think of the, the structural um, pipelines do still allow for the um, uh, information to, pro to propagate, producing an in in interesting and reasonable pattern of functional connectivity, but it's still not as good as when you actually have the, the source model data as the driver. So the source model data is, that is the best uh, for, for getting a reasonable model. If you dive down in terms of what actually, what, what the, the um, state variables look like and the balance between the um, local dynamics and what's what, and the immersion dynamics either through the EEG or the fMRI data, um, you do reproduce things um, that you, you, you see in empirical data routinely. Um, for example, um, the phase of the alpha uh, corresponds to the increase in local inhibition. Um, the variations in power also re relate to um, the increase in local inhibition. We, uh, as, as you saw, we produce a nice inverse relationship between fMRI resting state and the variations in alpha. Um, all three of these features uh, do link quite nicely with the changes in excitatory inhibitory balance, both in terms of the strength, but also in terms of the timing. Um, so the timing part came out quite nicely from that model. And then also um, at the long range scale, there's a very nice emergence of power loss scaling for the network dynamics. These features all came out of the model for no extra cost. It was just basically what was there to, to fit the model. So it was quite nice to see this uh, coming out. And um, just to show you that at least the model was able to do both um, fitting to the empirical data, but also give us some additional um, information in terms of the relationship again between the biophysical aspects of the mean fields and then the emergent uh, data, um, both fMRI and EEG. Let's jump into the um, example from epilepsy. Um, this work's being driven by Dr. Yursa in Marseille. Um, his group's been working with epilepsy for a long time now. Um, and um, the model they, they uh, derived um, was based on the observations that you see in um, focal seizures. Uh, and this is a fairly stereotypical patterns. Um, these are traces from mice, um, single units, I believe. And what you see in terms of the spiking activity, this is shown in the blue traces, is that there's um, uh, fast spikes that go back to sort of a, uh, quiet activity. So you alternate between fast spiking and then quiet activity in, in the cell. Um, there's also a, a slow change in extracellular potassium, uh, which you see is moving at a much slower rate than the uh, the spiking neurons per se. Um, if you do a bit more of a, uh, a longer um, uh, window, you do see that this potassium currents uh, start changing right gradually and then increase to a point where you actually start having um, seizure activity. Um, you can see, again, very nice timing between the change in the um, slow movement of, of the extracellular um, potassium and the in induction spiking, suggesting that this, these focal seizures are actually the interplay of a fast and a slow variable. And that interplay um, between a, 
uh, slow variable that was really enabling and the fast variable that shows the spiking activity is what was at the heart of what's uh, called the epileptor model. That is now really an alternation of periods of rest and fast dischargers um, that are enabled by the movement of the slow variable. So if we look at this top um, trace here, <clears throat> the phenomenological model, the epileptor itself has the slow variable, which is seen as sort of orange uh, moving across time. As this changes its values, it enables the spiking activity as it goes back to um, very negative, the, it it's, uh, basically quenches, if you will, or, or that you have an exit bifurcation actually that um, goes back to rest. And as, as the value and slow variable changes, you have an entry bifurcation, fast discharges, exit bifurcation, and then it goes back to rest. Um, you can put that in a phase diagram. You have the slow variable here that as it changes its values, you have entry bifurcation, spiking activity. Uh, and then as the slow variable changes back, you have an exit bifurcation, you've got a rest. And it nicely uh, relates to what you see empirically. So this um, phenomenological model now is at the heart of modern epilepsy at a large scale factor. And it's been used to look at um, candidate regions that could be the epileptogenic zone in clinical uh, cases. So one of the first cases was actually from a, a female patient who had bilateral temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, it wasn't clear from initial uh, evaluations using stereotaxic uh, intracranial EEG um, where the primary um, seizure focus was. Uh, you see this is um, some examples of the intracranial um, EEG. Um, this is done in virtualized form in this particular patient. Um, her brain is virtualized. You see her connectome here. This is her T1 um, map turns of different regions. These are the DTI data looking at the, the weights of the connections as well as the length of the connections. Um, they did find that there was some uh, an interesting um, uh, white matter connections that were, were there through the subcortical regions and the hypothalamus that weren't there in other individuals. And this is something I'll come back to uh, a little bit later. The main purpose again for this exercise is to now go through the entire model with all these different nodes and find out um, which of these nodes are likely the epileptogenic zone, which would be the target for um, resection, for example, from surgery, and which is a propagation zone, which you want to leave alone um, if you actually do the surgery. So this is uh, um, this is her data, and this is actually what her uh, intracranial EEG looks like. Um, each different colors indicate one of the um, the leads, the, the electrodes, and there are a number of contacts for each of the balls and this indicate one of the contacts. Um, as you go across time, you see um, the seizure emerging in uh, the left hippocampus, I believe it was. Um, and then um, there's a, a, a delay and then at some point the seizure probably gets over to the contralateral hemisphere and then ends um, here. So these are the clinical data that they have in the individual. Again, they've got leads in one hemisphere, the other in the other hemisphere, and this is supposed to help them find out where the seizure might be. Um, so this is the virtual brain model. You see, again, this is the, the electrodes that are now put in the virtual model. The other points here are meant to indicate that there are nodes that we can assess for epileptogenicity or, or, or hypersetability, if you will, or seizures. Um, that were not necessarily part of the um, clinical uh, work itself. And this is an important thing again. So in the model, uh, the seizure starts in the right hippocampus. Um, spreads into the thalamus. Now in um, the model, um, you can again assess what the likely paths are and the likely paths here were suggesting that it's actually um, more likely that it's propagates through thalamus and then crosses over to the left uh, hemisphere. And that's where the propagation happens to recruit the left hippocampus into the left temporal lobe and parahippocampal regions. And then finally, the seizure um, terminates. So before we go there, so this is a good example of, of two things. One is the model re does reproduce the propagation of the seizure quite well, but it also suggests a, a, a way that the seizure spreads that may not be obvious um, from clinical measures because they didn't measure in that area. So they didn't measure thalamus where in fact the scene that thalamus is the way that the seizure propagates and it propagates quite fast, which has made it difficult for them to, to, to be certain that the seizure uh, focus was in the left hemisphere versus right hemisphere, what these 
the model suggested that, that in fact, the, the, the primary focus for this seizure was, in fact, on the right um, hippocampus. And so this patient, as well as several other ones, were um, uh, tested to see retrospectively um, if you if they did the resection where the um, uh, virtual brain suggested should be resection, um, the the prediction was quite well, um, and they can, the 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 um, agreement between the clinician and the virtual brain is good, and the outcome was was quite well. So here you see on the on the far uh, right that the the rate of the difference was between what TV suggested should be resected and what was actually resected, the worse the outcome was um, for 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 um, uh, the surgery after after it was done. And so this small study uh, uh, was used to make a case for a clinical trial, which is now ongoing in France. And now there's a, a national clinical trial involving uh, about 400 uh, patients that are being um, randomized where they either have TDB to help uh, identify the uh, seizure focus or, uh, or, or just the clinical uh, measures directly. And they're going to compare um, the outcomes, um, and this is working. We don't know the uh, the answers yet, but it, it does it does seem to be suggesting that there is some benefits by having virtual brain as a um, another guide for 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 identifying which are the likely um, seizure regions in the brain. And this is now uh, uh, expanded using a model inversion with a Bayesian inference framework to identify the likelihood for certain regions being seizure prone. So this plot is giving in the violin plots for um, how well um, the likelihood of a particular region being seizure uh, activity and the suggests that some regions are more uh, likely to be seizures of uh, generators, whereas other regions are not based on the, the Bayesian evidence um, in the model. So it's a nice example. And this is actually a good example of the combination of a of generative and predictive model where the model inversion and the Bayesian framework is actually more on the predictive side of things whereas the generative model, of course, is the virtual brain uh, epileptor uh, itself. So a few other examples, just briefly, of, of clinical applications. Um, just one slide for each one of these. Uh, I did mention that brain stimulation was one of the things that's, that's a more recent um, uh, uh, evolution of the virtual brain using deep brain stimulation. This is work, again, led by Petra Ritter's group in Berlin, um, where they've merged um, two different models. Uh, one is the general um, uh, TDB model, and the other one is a spiky model because of ganglia using a, a platform called Anarchy. And using um, this model, they're able to do the um, stimulation in the, in the virtual brain and show the difference, the, the changes in um, uh, propagation, uh, first of all, by having the, the decreased limb activity in the resting state, which would be uh, an indication, for example, of some um, pathological state. And then by stimulation, you can normalize um, the thalamic activity and then get the cortical activity be uh, re 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 uh, recovered from there. So it's, it's entirely uh, proof of principle, but at least it shows that you can model deep brain stimulation and reproduce what you see um, in um, the alleviation of, in this particular case of um, Parkinson's symptoms. Um, we have applied it to dementia. This is a, a emerging application. This is a paper from my uh, student, uh, Joel Zimmerman, who's now working in California. And what here we did is took uh, some data from uh, the Sydney um, uh, aging study that's been ongoing now for uh, about 10 years, and they're looking at some prospective uh, study. Um, what we did here is took a snapshot in the, in the initial part of the study of people who were um, had um, mild Alzheimer's disease, those who had mild cognitive impairment, but not really clear whether they had Alzheimer's or something else. And then finally, um, age match healthy controls. Um, we took their fMRI data, fMRI resting state, um, derived the uh, parameter estimates, and then related the model parameters to um, their cognitive measures. And what you see here are the, is the correlation between them and the differentiation between them. So again, this is an example of a combination of generative and, and predictive models. Um, what's nice here is that there are patients who have, who have MCI that are more like um, healthy controls than patients who are um, uh, have MCI that are more like dementia patients. So again, to get a better stratification in this group, that's the, the tough one is the MCI patients to figure out whether they're actually showing Alzheimer's effects or something else. So again, proof of principle that the model does in fact help. And if you put it together with a predictive framework, um, you get even, even a better um, bang for the buck, if you will. 
Um, the last example, uh, uh, this is again a, a proof of principle where you could simulate neuropharmacological um, uh, interventions. Uh, another Alzheimer's model where um, we changed the immediate field approximation to um, have it be hyperexcitable, um, which is one of the features you see in dementia that ends up changing the frequency spectrum and reducing the uh, mid frequencies and actually pushing the power spectrum a bit more slow. Um, and then what we did is give virtual memantine uh, to change the excitatory balance. Um, so we had an amyloid beta deposition, which reduces the inhibition, leading to hyperexcitation. By giving it memantine, you sort of uh, try and reduce or uh, reestablish the excitatory inhibitory balance. Um, this part of the, of the spectrum, this is just showing global coupling um, across time, but this is actually showing the, uh, the peak of the power spectrum. Um, and what you see in the Alzheimer's model is that the, the alpha peak goes away. Um, it's there in the MCI patients that were modeled, and it's also there in the healthy controls. When you give the memantine, you reestablish that alpha peak quite nicely, suggesting you sort of reestablish or rebalance the power spectrum uh, by giving it virtual memantine. Again, this is proof of principle that we could do this um, uh, drug therapy, if you will, uh, virtually, and that could be a workflow that could be then adopted for other um, exa um, examinations of pharmacological interventions. So I'll finish off with just an evaluation um, of the platform, and then we have some time for some questions. Um, for the virtual brain, as we're using it now, um, the good part is it's model agnostic. Uh, I'm, by that, I mean that it, the only assumption is that we're looking at large-scale networks, and that's the level that we want to, to, to focus at. But the actual um, model that's used to, to, to impart dynamics is really up to the, to the investigator. Again, you can go from simple oscillatory models, like a, a Kuramoto oscillator, to much more complicated multi-componential um, biophysical models, like, for example, the Reduce Wang Wang model I showed you, but also even more complicated, like Stefanescu or so 3D. Uh, and there's far more now there that are there than I can remember. Um, it's nice that it can be integrated with empirical data directly. So it ends up being a way to um, incorporate TBB as part of your workflow when you're analyzing um, your data. It's scalable, so you can change the number of um, parcels you want from a very coarse parcelation to a much more elaborate surface model or even a mean, uh, neural field model, um, so long as you have the appropriate um, uh, computational about, uh, power. Um, what I didn't mention is that we now have a, a data pipeline for MRI or human data that's been validated now and can be used to take your collection of um, uh, MRI and EEG data, pull it together in a data pipeline so that you can then move it towards virtual brain. Uh, and that's right, so it's, it's very easy then to integrate um, the modeling platform into your workflow. And getting back to this differentiation about the generative models, it does allow you to make inferences about the mechanisms that are that are uh, in the data and potentially causal inferences, although that's uh, a little more, more tricky sometimes. Some of the bad things is that um, the, the nonlinearities that are inherent do make um, model a bit of a challenge in terms of fitting. You can obviously overfit data, um, but also because of nonlinearities, you have a, a challenge of identifiability. So sometimes the models, um, just because of the inherent nonlinearity, become non-identifiable, um, which you have to account for by changing the parameter ranges, for example. Um, there's currently no model plasticity per se, um, like spectrum independent plasticity is not part of the system at the moment. Um, that's a work in progress, so that will probably be ready to go um, in the next release. Um, neurotransmitter distribution um, has been attempted, but there's no uh, good solution on how to do that in any sort of, um, I think, valid way, it's sort of been inferred, but we're still working on doing that. There are plugins now that you can put in that that uh, come from the Allen Human Brain Atlas that allow you to do things like genetic uh, variation across cortical regions, as well as potential neurotransmitter distributions. But we're still working on, on modifying some of the mean field equations to incorporate timing differences in neurotransmitters. Um, getting back to this model agnostic aspect, um, we really are focused on models that are at the population level. So we're not really making inferences of what happens at the synapse. You're looking at inferences that are happening really at the circuit. And as the model's um, complexity increases, of course, interpretability becomes an issue, particularly if you're trying to relate the model parameter to some emergent sort of cognitive function. 
but that's part of the fun and that's actually part of the challenge as well for how we're doing neuroscience. We've been very good in neuroscience about finding ways to, to pull the brain apart and measure different aspects of it, whether you mentioned local field potentials, you're measuring white matter, you're measuring cell um, circuits, you're measuring different regions. Um, and it's really our job to think about how all these pieces work together. And that's why I think things like virtual brain are important uh, complement to these workflows because it does allow you then to integrate these data in a way that potentially will give you more insight in how these different pieces of the brain work together to enable um, our brains to function um, as they do. So with that, I will, I will pause now. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to take them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. McIntosh. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Uh, is there any questions from the, the audience? Please. A hand up from Howard Schneider. Uh, yeah. yeah, please. Yeah. Dr. McIntosh, that, yeah. that, is it okay? Uh, thank you. Yep. Excellent presentation. Fast, alternately fascinating work, fascinating simulation you guys are doing. I, I have thank a you. question. How does this compare to like the spawn of Chris Ellis, Eli, Elias Smith? Smith, yeah. So spawn is not really a biophysical model. Um, okay. It has function. Um, so certainly the, the way that Chris put it together is that the, the pieces do particular operations. Um, and so what he's done is he's, he's, he's doing, um, it's a generative model as well. Um, but it's 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 most of its instantiations are more focused on on function and less on the biophysical aspects. So that's the primary difference. Our, our model does not have the functions that Chris's model has, and Chris's model does not have the biophysical stuff that we have. So there are opportunities, of course, to merge them. And Chris has done a few um, extensions where he's put some biophysical parameters, but by and large, his his, his model is more in sort of the, the traditional kind of. Um, uh, McClellan Romer Hart kind of model where you've got a function that's there, you put different modules that have rudimentary functions together to have something like quirky memory emerged, and that's sort of how Chris's model works. Oh, okay, uh, thank you again. Eric. Uh, uh, great talk, thank you. Appreciate it. Somebody else? Any other questions? Well, if not, uh, thank you very much, Dr. McIntosh. Uh, okay. We appreciate uh, very much the talk. We had a, a little emergency here in the room where we were uh, listening to you because we had an earthquake. <laughs> so, oh no! <laughs> so, so, yeah, the, the whole audience here uh, left left the building. Oh my so, god! Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So not uh, my fault. I didn't do any. Not my fault. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, but but if you if you uh, put your your mail or something, maybe some of the of the people in the in the room that left the room can can reach you. Okay, and I think you um, my email address uh, in the chat window. Um, yeah, um, if, I'm happy to, to take any questions. Did you? I can't remember if you, you recorded this. Is that correct, or maybe the recording had to be stopped? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're recording it. Yeah. Okay, great. So yeah, I mean, uh, you, you have it recorded. So if anybody has any questions, you know, just send me an email. I'm happy to respond. I can also jump onto a Zoom call if you want more information. But <laughs> thank you very much. My, my pleasure. Uh, hope <laughs> everybody's you. safe and take care. No, everything. Everything is okay. Thank you. Good. Bye bye. Bye.